Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to welcome our next guest. She's Dina Shakir, a partner at Lux Capital, a multi-stage venture capital firm with $4 billion under management, where she invests in transformative technologies, improving lives and livelihoods. She's particularly interested in intersectional and underdog entrepreneurs, building breakthrough companies to accelerate advances and equity in human and population health. She has led a number of investments across stages and sectors, including in women's health, Maven Clinic, Alive, Adeen, digital healthcare infrastructure, SteadyMD, H1, Health Equity, Waymark, Foodtech, Shiro, and Fintech, MOS, and Ramp. Prior to joining Lux, she was a partner at Google Ventures, previously led product partnerships at Google for early stage products in healthcare, AI, machine learning, and search at Google, and directed social impact investments at google.org. Welcome to SheBC. I'm your founder and host, Gayatri Sarkar. I'm super excited to welcome you, Dina, on SheVC Podcast. And how are you doing today? Thank you for having me, guys, Ray. I'm doing well. It's great to spend some time with you. No, absolutely. Pleasure is mine. And uh, first of all, congratulations on your investment at Waymark. And um, I'm so excited to have you because you're doing some amazing trailblazing investments in healthcare and frontier technology sectors. I would love to know from you how your experience as an Arab woman helps you to empathize with early stage founders, especially when you're writing the first institutional check. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, to share a bit more on some of our investments and our thesis and can start there as well on, on my personal background. Um, you know, I think in this day and age, there is such a plethora of capital out there. And, you know, it's a very different environment than it was in the early days of venture capital, where, you know, we are often competing for the best uh, to get into the best deals, which is something that's sometimes hard to explain to those outside the industry. You know, my parents still don't understand, wait, hold on, you're the one writing checks and you're, you're hustling this hard. But, um, you know, there's many different ways to differentiate yourself, to connect, to stand out. I think um, there's, there's historically been a bit of a disconnect between one's personal identity and what they bring as an investor or even as an entrepreneur. Um, and I think that's really changing. And healthcare is one of the, of the examples where you see an abundance of entrepreneurs who come to the table um, with an idea and with a conviction and a real chip on their shoulder that comes from their own personal narrative, whether it's a struggle with a chronic disease, whether it's a traumatic experience with childbirth, um, et cetera. And I, I believe that should be the case as well for uh, investors. And so I'm unapologetic about my con you know, conviction around women's health, not just because I am a woman, but because of some uh, personal experiences I've had as well that led to some of my investment theses. Um, and you know, my, my background, um, like anyone's background, also informs who I am and, um, and why I do what I do. So you know, as um, a first-generation Iraqi-American, my parents you know, immigrated here um, decades ago. And um, you know, that, that has had a very transparent transformative effect on a lot of things, not just where I invest, but, you know, why I have the ambition I have, you know, I, I grew up in the Bay Area and not Baghdad, you know, during uh, a time of several wars of sanctions of, um, you know, witnessing devastation in my parents home country while simultaneously recognizing the, the privilege of being able to um, go to school and, you know, have an education and have the, you know, the, the freedom to seek access to healthcare and so on. So I really felt that that um, acknowledgement of my good fortune uh, drove a lot of what I do and what I have done and, and really felt this urgency to pay it forward um, in a way that continues to, to drive me today. No, that's that's so true. First of all, we are speaking at a time when there's a war going on, um, you know, uh, between Russia and Ukraine and uh, Russia is invading Ukraine. It's a very different time, but you have seen first start experience while living in US, what's happening in Iraq. And um, when I started SheVC podcast, I realized representation matters. 
So women who are out there in those emerging countries, in war-torn countries, they can understand like they can be like you. And that's why the importance of this podcast and having those voices matters so much. So coming back to the question, you know, as a former founder and um, as a journalist and someone who worked at White House, how did that experience shape your investment theses when you're writing checks in early stage? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, well, for thank you first of all for acknowledging what's going on. It's you know it's it's um, it's actually been hard to focus today. Just you know felt personally a little triggered um, by what's happening. I think all of us are having a hard time, you know, going on with our daily lives when there's a war unfolding before our eyes. But I didn't expect to feel so personally um, affected just given some of the trauma of of remembering uh, what happened in Iraq. So um, you know, definitely my mind is uh, is with Ukraine right now. Um, in terms of um, in, you know the investments, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, my background is is not typical if such a thing exists. Um, for VC, although as I say that, I realize I just like created, <laughs> I just mentioned a meme account, not your typical VC, which I think everybody says, but in truth, it's not what I thought I would be doing by any means. You know, as I mentioned, I had this uh, real drive for impact. And, and um, at the time when I was growing up in the Bay Area, there really wasn't a lot to do here if you weren't working on you know, chip development or kind of very early days of software, if you had these global aspirations, if you had a desire for impact, um, this wasn't necessarily where you would be. And so I really never thought I would live here again after I left to go to college on the East Coast and, you know, thought I was going to be a journalist, thought I might do human rights work, you know, potentially work in policy. And I did a lot of those things. Um, and eventually, you know, um, in the early 2010s, as software starts eating the world, as, as tech was no longer a separate sector, but was really becoming a way of doing a lot of things um, differently, in some cases with more uh, equity and, uh, you know, literally and figuratively, and in some ways with more efficiency, uh, I was really drawn to come back. I felt this magnetism. I felt the center of gravity that was really shifting, um, you know, both geographically, but also in terms of, of sectors. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, that intersectional and non, you know, linear background lends itself well to what I do, because we, we want to look for things before they're obvious. We want to be able to recognize signal outside of the obvious factors. Um, and so I, I do tend to seek a lot of that out in the entrepreneurs that, um, you know, that we're funding. No, I totally appreciate that. And, you know, you joined Google Ventures and then Lux Capital as one of the first few women partners, person of color. You know, the number of women GPs, let's talk about the, the statistics. It's like in a VC fund grew from 7% in the last few years to almost 28%. And I think the number will be better now. While the majority of the firms, which is 65% or less than that, they still don't have a female GP. And we mostly see, um, you know, uh, a woman associate or a, more like an analyst or a principal. What advice do you want to give to VC funds who want to attract and empower female entrepreneurs and investors like you in a partner role? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, when I joined GV, the artist formerly known as Google Ventures, um, it wasn't as a check writer. It was as a partner, but I was on the operating side. So my job was really focused post-investment. Um, and, you know, there were a number of years before that where I wanted to get into venture and, you know, it definitely felt um, a bit of a brick wall or glass ceiling, if you will, uh, in a lot of ways. I think Things have changed. The environment has changed. The numbers have changed. Uh, not enough, not nearly enough. And, you know, tokenism is not going to help any of us um, when it comes to diversity on cap tables and diversity in terms of uh, funders. But there has been some progress. And, you know, organizations like Allraise didn't even exist back then when I was, um, you know, thinking of moving into venture. And so there is an incredible peer support group now of women check writers, GPs, um, and also among the, um, the emerging partners, the associates and analysts. And so I think that's great. Um, you know, I, 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 your right representation matters. Uh, it matters a lot, not just for, you know, uh, people in, who are currently already in the industry, but for the next generation. You know, my, uh, I tweeted this out um, a few months ago, but um, my daughter, who is six and a half, um, and I guess she was probably around six at the time, asked me one day if boys can also grow up to, to be VCs. Yeah, um, you know, that was, 
<laughs> yeah. And that was just such a moment for me. Like, wow, that's all she sees and all she knows, not just because of me, but a lot of my, you know, very close friends in the industry also happen to be women. Um, and, and we are, you know, there for each other in many ways, whether it's sharing deal flow and teaming up on, on deals or, you know, helping to navigate through the, the waters there. So in terms of advice to folks, you know, I, you know, I, it's not a pipeline issue. There are so many women that uh, we know, um, you know, and I know, and that come to us all the time would be incredibly qualified. Um, you know, I think looking beyond the obvious is critical, not just to get more diversity, but really to find the best investors and the best entrepreneurs. Uh, if you look at the most iconic and storied investors over time, they really don't fit any one template. There's not, you know, one single path anymore. It's not starting off in finance. It's not just necessarily building and selling a company. It's not coming from, you know, big tech. Like there, there is no clear path. And so being able to really focus more on the raw skills um, that are critical, the, the ability to synthesize topics quickly, to be able to uh, see signal from the noise, to in some cases have deep expertise on particular sectors, but also be able to ask the right questions and have the right networks and, and all of that. Um, that. Those are, I think, the key drivers in, in attracting talent and not just attracting, but also retaining. Yeah, absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. I think it's so important that you can, um, you know, see through so much of noises that are coming, especially in early stage and also growth stage, late stage has their own noises. Um, one of the thing I would love to uh, know from you, you know, joining a partner in an existing VC fund, it's a very different dynamic, especially um, with uh, different terms and opportunities. How do mid-career women, entrepreneurs and investors like you should navigate such career aspirations? Yeah, you know, I think um, it, there again, there's no like one size fits all advice. Although I was reflecting with a with a friend of mine um, who's a partner at a at a large VC firm as well on our transition coming from operating into into venture, and we actually put together an article that I published in Forbes on this, which um, you, you should check out if you're interested. But there are a lot of lessons to learn. It's definitely not easy, you know. Venture has been a, uh, a you know a cl closed close-knit club, uh, largely a boys club for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and, and so it is hard to penetrate, especially when you're coming in as a new investor, but at a senior level in your career. And so being able to, you know, quickly not only get up to speed on the mechanics, which frankly, you know, that that piece of it is, is, is not the hard part, but really to, you know, to, to, to understand where you know networks come from and how you can develop strong theses and how you manage your time and how you get feedback when you're used to sort of the quick feedback loops of being an operator. Those are all challenges um, that a lot of folks coming in at that level face. Um, you know, and so there's there's no one way to do it. I think it's perhaps hard at an early stage in your career to know if you want to be a VC, um, but there are certainly excellent opportunities to, to start and grow a career there. Um, but there are also ways to do so in addition to an operating role to start, you know, to the extent that you have the ability to make small angel investments, to, you know, become a scout, to get involved in sourcing companies, um, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I don't think it necessarily has to be um, a, a career path, if you will, that looks you know, like a, the traditional kind of progression or trajectory that you would normally see. No, no, I totally agree. I think that's, that's so true. It looks very glamorous, but that's a lot of work that goes into effect. And since we are talking about venture capital that has not been disrupted for quite a long period of time, the, the, the biases and the prejudices that comes in effect specifically um, to women founders, I would love to know, you know, what was your experience and where do you think is the systemic problem when it comes to funding more women founders? Ooh, tough one. You know, I think there's been uh, quite a bit of research and data on this. And in general, whenever I think about diversity in, in the industry, I always point to the data because that's, that's really where, um, you know, where we have to ground our discussion. So um, I do that in a number of ways. Number one, in terms of this, the studies on bias, because, you know, it, it is by definition a very hard thing to measure, um, but it's been done. You know, there's a, there, there's a report um, that, you know, examined women founders versus male founders um, pitching at um, 
uh, business plan competitions and the sort of questions that were asked towards women versus male founders um, that that you know has has often been cited. Um, and you know it, across the board, it was clear that women were being asked more about the risks rather than about the you know the potential upside of the business. And so that's definitely something worth examining. Um, there is also a plethora of data that shows that women founders and women founding teams, diverse founding teams, diverse cap, cap tables perform better across the board. We're talking faster time to exit. We're talking better ROI, uh, better performing teams, literally all of the indicators that you would want to look for. Um, and this has been, you know, published by PitchBook and, uh, and a number of other outlets. Coffin Fellows has published research as well, pointing to the, the correlation between diverse cap tables and diverse founding teams. So these are all things we know. Um, it's really how do you take that data and you know, digest it in such a way that it, that it impacts the day-to-day the -day decisions that are made. And part of that is really you know, ensuring that the folks around the table are um, reflective of the founders and the populations that you ultimately want to be serving. No, absolutely. I totally agree. And you are an investor in Maven Clinic, founded by two amazing female founders. Um, tell me more about your investment, you know, portfolios and how do you look um, specifically for women or diverse founders and what diversity mean to you in your fund? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm happy to shout about Maven Clinic anytime. It's um, a company I'm incredibly excited about. Um, but you know, as I as, as I mentioned, I, I I think looking at the data, not only around women founders, but also the the fields and sectors that they're innovating in, is really important. Uh, if you look at my portfolio, you'll see. You know, I I don't only invest in women founders. In fact, you know, some of the um, most exciting companies, you know, in my portfolio, like Waymark, which you mentioned, like A Life and SteadyMD and H1, are founded by men. So that's not a criteria that I limit by um, by any means. I think there are many ways to um, ensure not only diversity but in inclusion and equity, uh, and really bake that into to a company in the earliest days. Uh, a Life is a great example of that. It's a company that was founded by. Paxton Mater York, um, and you know who who happens to be a uh, a man and, and innovating in an incredibly exciting way in a uh, you know not just women's health but you know family health field. Uh, I think for in many cases fertility is, is framed uh, as a women's health problem when you know it literally takes two to tango and yeah. um, statistically it's more than just about women. But in any case. You know, Paxton is a great example of um, a founder who has ensured his team is um, incredibly diverse at the executive level and at the operating level, that his cap table um, is, is diverse, and, um, and also that the data that is grounding the technology is based on a diverse data set, which is very, very important for, um, in particular for, for women's health, where most of the protocol that we follow or that clinicians follow is based on an incredibly Eurocentric and anachronistic uh, data set. So that's that's an example of, uh, you know, of that. Um, Maven Clinic is, is, an, is an incredible story. I'm so proud to be uh, an investor. And you know, as, we, as you know, we co-led the Series D along with Dragoneer. Um, Kate Ryder is an extraordinary founder whose um, resilience and, and passion for what she does shines through and has resulted in Maven Clinic being the, the absolute you know, clear category leader in women's and family health, offering uh, comprehensive care from you know, the earliest days of preconception all the way through pediatrics in the first 10 years of life, really grounding um, this idea of women's and family health as uh, you know, the key driver for, um, for, for broader healthcare. And that's also been demonstrated as well. They are focused not only on the employer market, but also in Medicaid, where you know nearly half the babies in this country are born, it's a it's a space that, of course, Waymark is also innovating in, and it's absolutely critical if we want to uh, you know ultimately improve outcomes here that we finally start to invest in the populations that need it most in a way that is not um, you know lip service, but is actually grounded in the realities on the ground. No, absolutely, I totally agree with you, and especially with COVID, the healthcare 
industry has changed so much. So as a specialist and a healthcare investor, I would love to know from you that how do you uh, look at the industry and the trends? I know I'm a little bit going off the questions, but I would love to know, especially your involvement as a board of director, you know, helping these companies understanding what are the latest opportunities that are coming in the market. So would love to know your, you know, broad thought process in that. Yeah, it's been fascinating to observe the evolution over the, the last few years. You know, I, um, my journey in healthcare started uh, almost 10 years ago when I was at Google and helping to, to build what eventually became Google Health. Um, and, you know, at that time, and even just a few years ago, there really wasn't such a clear venture return profile for digital health. You know, before Livongo and before, um, you know, so many of these large financings and certainly before COVID, uh, you know, created some tailwinds for virtual care as well as for, you know, in the R&D space. It wasn't necessarily the most popular uh, space to, to invest in. You know, today the public markets are, um, you know, in, in, in a certain spot, but uh, that's, you know, that's not the kind of thing that drives early stage investment. You've got to believe uh, in the long-term vision. Um, you know, I was reflecting back over the last few years when COVID first started, you know, um, actually just a month, I think, after Shelter in Place, I, I did a podcast with a friend, Kristen baker Spoon, who's also a digital health investor over at CRV, and we sort of set forth our predictions for what will happen here. Um, neither of us could have ever imagined we'd be in, a, in the situation we're in, you know, almost two years later now, and that would be experiencing a pandemic that has truly, you know, catalyzed um, I, a shake throughout the industry that, you know, is here is here to stay. Um, and it's not just about telemedicine and virtual care. You know, telemedicine has been around since carrier pigeons existed, ever since there was, you know, a, a way to interact with a clinician or a doctor that wasn't, you know, in a, a brick and mortar setting. Um, but, you know, it really propelled this sort of digital transformation in the industry from a nice to have to a must have, opened up cost centers, I think, that are here to stay. Um, it shined a light on the imperative for things like diversity and clinical trials, as we saw through uh, the development of the vaccine. Um, and, you know, even things like tools for R&D uh, and certainly around care delivery as well. So there are so many facets that uh, I think have opened up here that, again, are uh, laying the foundation for the type of transformation that will continue to exist. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So let's talk a little bit about Lux Capital, you know, with an asset under management um, over $4 billion, what differentiates Lux from most of the other larger funds that are out there in terms of taking position from incubation to, you know, till growth stage and late stage? And I would love to know the inherent strategy behind this. Is it mostly ownership or market share? Uh, yeah, would love to talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, a bit on Lux. Lux uh, Capital, we've been around for about 22 years, believe it or not. Wow. Started off back in the day as a small seed fund that was really focused on this idea of investing in the earliest days of company creation in in founders who were taking these sci-fi ideas and turning them into vi viable businesses. You know, at the time, again, wasn't such a clear venture return profile for what we now call deep tech or frontier tech or hard tech, you know, take your term of choice. Um, so, you know, to their credit, Peter and Josh, my partners who, who founded the firm, you know, in their early 20s, by the way, um, without also a, a very clear kind of venture capital, uh, you know, uh, bio or profile, it, it's pretty remarkable what they've done here. Um, and, and super proud to be part of the journey now. As you mentioned, we have 4 billion AUM, we're investing out of our seventh venture fund, uh, which is a $675 million uh, vehicle and our uh, growth fund, which is an $800 million vehicle. We're unique in a lot of ways. You know, We definitely still have that deep tech uh, DNA as part of uh, our thesis, but you know, we also invest in, in, in infrastructure and enterprise SaaS and digital health. There, there still needs to be some Thing really defensible and unique from a tech, either from a tech perspective or a business model perspective or a founding team perspective to get us excited there. Um, and you'll notice that theme across the companies that we invest in. It's the same group of us who invest across stages, which is also um, somewhat unique. Many of the larger firms, you know, have a separate growth team because there really is oftentimes a different calculus that goes into those investments. Um, but, you know, being the same group, it allows us to develop theses really early and kind of take a 
take an approach that's grounded in uh, a prior investment that we've made or a white space that we've helped to identify or, uh, you know, investing in, in companies at the early stages, helping us to identify who those category leaders are in the later stages. Um, and health has really been a part of the, the team's focus for, you know, from the very beginning um, with, with companies in biotech and drug discovery and therapeutics, digital and traditional, certainly in software um, and tech enabled services uh, and care delivery. Um, and it's increasingly more so. No, that's amazing. And I'm going again, a little bit off the question, like, I would love to know, what is Lux vision, especially when the market is changing so much, you know, when Lux started, it was a very different market. There was like Sequoia, Axel, um, and others were there. And now a lot of public market investors are coming into this. And it's a very different market that we're seeing right now. And I would love to know, I know we will be talking about valuations and others, but I would love to know the Lux strategy and vision down the road. And, uh, you know, you guys are such a unique um, capital investors and um, such value add investors. So we'd love to know that also. Yeah, um, well, I, you know, we don't, uh, you know, portend to know the future. By the time this, this comes out, maybe my, you know, maybe our views will have changed. So we're learning like everybody else. But, you know, I will say um, what has worked for us has been really focusing on, uh, on on thesis driven investing and you know being able to do so in areas that we know well that being said we are all generalists um, and so you'll see you know even our uh, deep tech PhDs doing investments in, in uh, companies that are outside of, of their, you know, academic wheelhouse. And, you know, although I focus a lot on digital health, I've done a little bit in fintech as well as food tech. Um, and so being able to bring those kind of intersectional uh, or, or interdisciplinary experiences to our investments is, uh, is something that's, that's really helpful. And, you know, we, continue to, to believe before it's obvious, um, both in sectors and in founders. And that's really helped us in terms of establishing ownership early on. Um, but that's not the only model. We're not just seed stage investors. So, you know, it, certainly, as, as I mentioned, um, taking stakes in companies at later stages and helping to, uh, you know, to, to, to bridge them um, to that next stage of growth, uh, to an IPO um, and, and beyond. So we really have to believe that there is a massive opportunity from a market perspective, um, you know, that there is not just a billion dollar opportunity, but, you know, these days a $10 billion plus, but also that, that it is matter that matters, that these are uh, technologies, innovations, teams that are improving lives and advancing humanity. That's always been a part of our goal. We're fundamentally driven, uh, you know, by the ambition to be stewards of capital for our LPs, many of whom are the, you know, some of the largest and, and most impactful philanthropic organizations. Um, but we do so by investing in 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 uh, in companies that also are creating a better future. No, that's amazing. And uh, let's talk about due diligence. You know, uh, what are your thought process on startup performance data, and how do you analyze? due diligence, specifically early stage and now growth stage, which looks very different than what it was like five years ago also. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, diligence at the earliest stage, you know, oftentimes we're investing in companies when it's a founder and an idea. Um, in those cases, you know, it, it is really about team and about market. So you have to believe that uh, this is an individual or a team of individuals who are going to yeah. Uh, outlive the idea, right? I mean, we've seen enough decks across stages that we know that the seed deck that or pre-seed deck that you see is going to look nearly nothing like what, uh, you know, the, the S1 will look like or, um, uh, you know, the, the IPO filing down the road. Or even so the that Series B. It, <laughs> or the Series B or the Series A. So in those cases, it's, you know, it, it's now tried to say, but truly it's fundamentally about the people. Uh, at the later stage, I mean, it's really always about the people, but at the later stage, you, you know, you do have metrics you can look at, you can look at, um, you know, depending on the, on the type of company, of course, if it's, you know, still in the early stage R&D side, you're looking at the science, if it's, a, you know, on the commercial side, you have other indicators to look at. Um, but we really do love to get to know founders over time. And again, that's the beauty of being able to invest across stages. There are companies that we missed, we should have done earlier and we didn't, but we, you know, had the opportunity to get to know the sectors and those teams over time so that we're not in a crunch when there's a, you know, crazy compressed diligence timeline so that we can, you know, take those th the thesis driven um, uh, investments and, and also, you know, have a really strong network of, of 
um, of operators, of um, change makers, of decision makers at some of the large customers out there who we can turn to not only for diligence, but also to identify those white spaces and, and proactively uh, identify the companies that we want to be seeking out. No, absolutely. So let's talk about valuation, you know, 2020, 2021, uh, completely different world, inflated valuation, and it is so difficult to even get into the primary rounds. I would love to know, like now we are seeing a lot of correction, at least in our growth and late stage side, would love to know your thought process that how you guys position yourself, especially when you have such a disciplined investment thesis, and also, you know, your outlook towards um, the valuation trend that's going to come. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm certainly getting asked this a lot. I honestly think it's still too soon to tell, uh, you know, how the public markets is going to affect early stage investing. I can tell you we're not seeing that much of an effect at all at the earliest stages. Um, you know, it's it's well known that, um, you know, at, at the earliest days, the value, you know, if you're being, you know, nitpicky on valuation, like that's, that's myopic. That's not to say you should be not price disciplined, um, but, you know, that you are investing uh, in the in the early days in these category creating companies. Um, and, you know, there's um, with the right element of conviction, that's not necessarily where you need to be, um, you know, focusing on uh, a couple million dollars here or there. At the later stage, different story, certainly. Um, and it remains to be seen what the public markets look like, particularly in health tech for these later stage companies. Um, but we're still seeing a crazy amount of, of uh, competition. Uh, we're still seeing uh, you know, extraordinary valuations across stages. Um, because I honestly think, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of health tech, that we're just beginning to see what this expanded market looks like over time, uh, right. that there are also so many funds that have been launched. I mean, how many billions of dollars in 2022 alone in new funds? So there's still a, a lot of capital out there to go into these early stage companies. And, you know, I think the opportunity is absolutely still there. And there's incredible talent on the founder side. I mean, it is remarkable. Like I often at the end of the day, just like literally pinching myself that I just met so many amazing people who are, you know, dedicating their life's work to building these companies. And, you know, it makes me really optimistic about the future. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, Insight just launched their $20 billion plus funds. And uh, I mean, it's amazing at the growth and late stage investment side, how things are changing. And everybody's talking about, oh, there is a change coming, correction coming. But again, we are seeing a lot of uh, funds are getting bigger and bigger. And um, it's a great opportunity for a lot of founders to uh, you know, follow their passion and make uh, a huge change in the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about the investment committee. You know, uh, it, as we were talking about VCs, all about identifying patterns, and sometimes the investment decisions can be non-consensus among partners. I would love to know what a good uh, process looks like from your end when your funds investment committee work together to make sure that you do not miss on good founders. And what kind of SWOT analysis do you guys do? Yeah, you know, I think it's 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 always interesting to hear how different funds approach consensus versus um, you know non consensus in terms of decision making. Um, and you know, again, just like there's no one VC, I think there's no necessarily one path to doing it. I think you know you will inevitably miss certain opportunities um, if you if you are focused on you know pure consensus. We, you know, we want to have that conviction, and and there are some investments that we have made in the past that were very controversial, where not everyone agreed, um, but where there was an extremely strong supporter pounding the table, um, and th that those investments have proven to be really uh, lucrative and fruitful for us. So, you know, we are very. Um, open about our you know, debates. Uh, if you follow any of us on Twitter, you'll see that we are not shy about opinions. And that really comes through in all of our discussions internally. And it's one of the reasons I chose to come to Lux. Like the, you know, I've mentioned thesis driven so many times now, but you know, the, um, the intellectual rigor that is applied to the way we make investments and the way we decide on investments is really, really um, extraordinary. Um, and, and that's something that um, I think is pretty special. No, I totally agree with you. And I love that, you know, love the intellectual, you know, um, um, brainstorming that goes on. But at the same time, 
the diverse ideas and the intellectual diversity matters so much in finding out great companies. And there's so much of unpredictable big ideas. And, you know, there's so much learning and to see things very differently, analyzing market thing very differently. And um, as I I'm coming back to my question, it's like, you know, sometimes you have to see things which are non-sexy to invest in VC. And I always say this, like venture capital is not a job, it's a lifestyle. You're always learning, you're always seeking out. So what are the learning habits that you have acquired? And also how do you analyze various thinking models? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I love this job. You you never stop learning. It's literally your job to learn and not just learning about sectors and people and things, but learning about yourself and learning about how decisions are made. There's a psychology component. There's an anthropology component. There's a sociology component. There's a philosophy component. It's really, really, really um, fun and and endless in that sense. Um, so, you know, it's it's a it's a constant process. I think, you know, there are so many decisions you have to make on a daily basis. Um, and that is exhausting, um, but also whether you like it or not forces you to, you know, have to, to follow your gut in some cases, um, in addition to listening to your mind. You learn over time that, you know, at least I've learned that um, the gut is incredibly powerful and it's not an instinct necessarily. It's driven by different intellectual forces, but you know, learning to, to listen to that has been really powerful for me. There have been cases where I, you know, um, my gut told me one thing, but my mind really wanted to believe something and tried to find a way to make it work and so on. And in those cases, I was wrong. Other times where my gut was right, but my mind was telling me certain things and I should have listened. So that's really a, a big learning for me, just around the sheer volume of decision making you have to make. Uh, the inbound that comes in, you know, it's literally my job to see all of that. Um, you know, I, I take cold DMs and, and cold pitches because I have been the, you know, the, the, the lucky person doing that who's had people take a chance on me, but it is literally impossible to respond to all of it. It's literally impossible to take all of those meetings. So you're going to miss things. You're going to have to say no to things. Um, you have to be at least for us, you know, we're, we take board seats often and, you know, we're active investors. And when you, when I commit to a company, I'm there, you know, you should, you can talk to any of the founders I've worked with. Most of them I talk to on a daily basis, multiple times a day, uh, thinking of them, like I have dreams about some of my companies, like, you know, it's very, very much a, um, you know, a, a, a very intimate um, relationship that you enter. And when you, when you do that, that doesn't scale infinitely right? You can't, it's just impossible. And so that, that is increasingly more of a, of a constraint in terms of taking on new investments. Like you obviously, you know, there's so many new things happening and some of them are very exciting, but it, you know, there is that trade-off when you eventually are, um, you know, on many boards and have a lot of commitments there. So that raises the bar too. I mean, I could talk for hours about the types of, dis, you know, learnings in this regard, but um, th those are some of the flavors, um, you know, of no, the I learning. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. And I cannot believe I'm coming to my last question. You know, I have a kid, I have a three-year-old, and I, I find it very hard to manage this with my work. I would love to know, you know, as a mother of two amazing kids, how do you manage your work-life balance? And I know you talk about that a lot on Twitter also. So mm -hmm. we'd love to know what are your top three tips, you know, that you want to give young mothers like me and parents that are managing children and doing venture. Oof. Well, I'll start by saying that um I would love to hear tips because I am not doing it well. Um, it's exhausting. It's it's all consuming. It's hard. You know, I think this sort of glorification of like, you know, women doing it all, et cetera, is really problematic, which is partly why I am so uh, unabashed and open about how hard it is. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as doing it all. Um, you know, it's, or, or doing it all at once, at least. Um, so lots of things, lots of balls are dropped all the time, all the time. And personally, I constantly feel stretched and that I'm not doing enough of anything. I'm not being as active of a mom as I need to be. I'm not being as present of a mom as I need to be. I'm not being as present of a wife as I, as I need to be, or a daughter or a sister. Uh, or a friend. Um, you know, I can't remember the last time I cooked something. I, I used to like it, but you know, that's got to go. You know, I'm well, two for too long, had dropped the ball on working out, finally started trying to get back into it. But, you know, something's always got to give. There's always something else. And that's one of the things about being a mom that I learned, uh, you know, especially 
especially, you know, uh, after having my first, but definitely after having more than one, is just, it forces you to prioritize in a way, yes. right? That is just unthinkable before that. You just, you just can't conceive that you could be that hyper-efficient, that you could be that productive, that you could be that good. You know, I certainly thought I was a very hard worker my whole life and I had lots of energy and did lots of things, but when everything I did was a trade-off between being with a human who is physically, emotionally dependent on me, I'm sure you felt every, every mom I know feels the same way. It really just like you transcend a level of, um, you know, getting shit done that like didn't exist before. It's one of the reasons I love investing in moms, because I know what it did to me and I've seen what it's done to, you know, uh, founders in my portfolio. And I have to do the math there at least three, or if not four of them have had, have been pregnant and had babies over the last two years. And, you know, what my first investment at Lux, um, and, you know, Dr. Jasmine Hume from Shiro, she was eight or nine months pregnant when we made that investment. And we were the, wow. you know, the first, first, uh, first institutional investor to come in. Um, and, you know, that she's expecting her second now. And it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing to see that. Um, so it's something that's hard. It's something I struggle with. Um, it's, you know, I have this incredible like VC moms group that I'm in, which has been um, such a wonderful source of um, many things, camaraderie, um, you know, um, commiseration, deal flow, uh, and all of the above. And, you know, I, I'm grateful that there are enough of us now that, you know, we can have a group like that and, and ever more that are coming to the, to the scene, but it's, a, it's a, it's a real challenge, honestly. But the truth is like any job, when you love it, it doesn't feel like work. And that's actually part of what's difficult for me. Like I, I don't feel like I want to complain about how much I'm working. I really don't like, I read, you know, pitch decks for fun on the weekends because it really is fun. I really enjoy it and love it. I also love being with my kids and, and all of that. And so the, the struggle for me is like, just like there are so many sectors and companies that I love, I can't spend time with all of them. So how do you, how do you do that? How do you get over the FOMO? Cause there's a lot of that in this industry. How do you um, manage your time? There's, you know, constant inbound for events to speak at and like zillion you know, articles on my, like, you know, on my list or on my mind of things I want to write, there's just no way to do it all. So one day at a time, one hour at a time, some yeah. days are better yeah. than others. No, I totally agree with you. You cannot have it all, but, um, you know, I think for us, it's so important to speak about this openly because there are a lot of women who are out there. Um, they want to have babies or they have babies and they're also struggling in the same way. And this is amazing. This is such an open conversation. And I really enjoy talking to you and especially someone who's such a trailblazer in our space, especially in the health tech sector. We know and we need more women investors like you. And I'm so glad that you came to SheVC. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the kind words. And there are a lot of us out there. Um, and, you know, I think we, you're right. We need to see those voices, hear those voices. We need more kids asking, you know, if boys can also become VCs and more entrepreneurs uh, taking the plunge. So I'm honored to be here. And thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Dina.